The lunatic is on the grass. The lunatic is on the grass. I want to talk to you today about the disaster which is Fukushima. I want to present some of the facts, the evidence, and some of the conclusions, which don't necessarily, when examined, jive with the Japanese government reports, the reports coming out of TEPCO, which are all lies anyway, and what the mainstream media has necessarily been telling us about this event. First, let's look at some of the facts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present to you some of the uh, photographs of this 9.0 quake that occurred approximately a year ago on March 11th of 2011. Now I want you to remember that this was a 9.0 earthquake preceding a tsunami. And in all of these photos, at least most of them except I think one or two, uh, the tsunami has already come in in these photographs and this is what I want to point out. In this photograph here, you see the tsunami waters have come in, yet I want you to look at the outlying structures. This tower building here, this farm, looks like a farm structure over here, this high-rise parking lot or apartment building over here, and most importantly, this bridge. None of these structures in these photos seem to have sustained any quake damage. Now in this photo, we're looking at a shot of Okai Bay during the quake, and we see a lot of smoke from fires. We see this smoke coming up here from somewhere, but Okai Bay is right on, uh, like, like all, um, I guess, waterfront properties. It, it's sitting on a silt-like ledge. Now when a silt, and I know because I've been in an earthquake when this has happened um, back east in Hoboken, New Jersey, but the apartment I was living on was on a silt ledge. And although the earthquake happened in upstate New York, in Ramapo, this ledge that butts right up against the water shook like a bowl of jelly. Now I want you to look at all these structures in here. High rise buildings, a really high rise building in the back here. But more specifically, I want you to look at this causeway or this skyway in the background. No damage, no damage at all. And again, here in, in another shot in Japan during the earthquake, yeah, we see some fires in the background, but I want you to look at the buildings here. Everything seems to be fine. And especially in the foreground here, this tremendously tall Ferris wheel, which doesn't seem to be tilting. It's It definitely hasn't been knocked down. I mean, you would think that in a 9.0 quake, this structure would be nowhere in the picture. And again, here's another photo from one of the outlying prefectures in Japan. And as the news would, would point your focus on all this damage and debris and, oh my God, there's stuff floating all around. Everything is broken. But if you look more closely at this picture, this is tsunami debris in here. Look at these buildings in the background. I mean, even this building here that's being overwashed by the tsunami debris, other than that damage, the building seems to be intact. And I want you to look at this house right here in the forefront of, of this picture here. No roof damage, seems to be no structural damage at all. And again, the, the, the news is telling us that this was a 9.0 quake. And here's another picture that supports what I'm, I'm trying to present here. There's a truck that fell into a crack that opened up in the road from the earthquake. But I want to, once again, I want to bring your attention to the near-lying structures here where there's no cracks. I mean, overhanging roofs didn't fall down. Here's something that's leaned up against the house and it doesn't even seem to have moved or fallen over or whatnot, and look at these houses in the background too. There just seems to be no structural damage other than the infrastructure damage that the truck fell into as a result of the quake. And again, I want to remind you, they're telling us this is a 9.0 quake. 
Now, I don't know, uh, many of you might, have re might recall that the day before the Japan quake, there was an earthquake in China that registered a 5.4 or a 5.8. I'd have to look through my notes to, you know, to be absolutely sure. But in any event, it was a, a, a moderate to large quake, 5.4, 5.8. And it happened the day before the 9.0 in Japan. It happened on 3, 10, 11. And in comparison here, I want to show you the damage done to the um, to the structures in this quake compared to the damage that we see, quake damage that we see in the photos from Japan. Now here in this house, it's completely knocked over. Um, I don't know what this is here, but there's all this debris piled up. Um, the house is leaning on its side here. This next picture, you know, you can see just all the rubble and the buildings themselves have collapsed. And in this picture down below right here, you see that an entire building collapsed in on itself. And again, here's, here's another picture. And this is a 5.4, 5.8. And I know a lot of you are probably thinking out there, well, Japan has protected this um, earthquake-proof um, building structure technology, and the buildings in Japan can withstand an 8.0 or a 9.0 earthquake. That may be true, but a 9.0 earthquake is about as bad as it gets. You're going to sustain some damage. And the architecture that you may be thinking of is predominantly used in Tokyo. And it's expensive, it's highly technological, and uh, it is not used in the outlying prefectures and the outlying, outlying farm communities and residential home structures. In the city of Tokyo, yes, that may be true, but none of these pictures were of the city of Tokyo. Now I want to show you here a, a picture of the USGS seismograph displays on 3.11.11. Okay, uh, these were captured by a YouTuber. I'll put a credit to her video in the description box later. But I want to show you how all of these seismographs are almost completely black. Okay, they're just black. They got lines. So they don't even look like real seismographs, is my point. And I remember that I too went to the USGS site the day of the quake and looked at the seismographs. And they, they actually looked just like um, they're being shown here. They're completely black. And I also remember that, the, and some of you out there may remember this too, but the USGS took down their link to their seismographic charts several hours after this earthquake hit. And I don't believe they brought them up for a day or, or a couple of days after 311. Then they were back up again. Now, here I want to show you, this is a, a, a site I found that's a, it's the strong go, strongmotioncenter.org. It's a seismic um, information site where you can go click on the cities and get the seismic readings for any particular day they had records for. Now I want to show you this. Okay, this is um, their seismographic readings let me see if I can bring this down here a little bit for you so you can see the whole thing okay this is 311 2011 this is at uh, the Sendai location here and it's put out by this company here KNET NIED but does this look anything like the USGS seismic graphs were reporting uh, here's another graph, and this was from uh, the Sendai MY013 um, sensor location, which I believe is located right across the street from the Sendai News television broadcasting station, where they showed a lot of shots of the 
newsroom shaking around and things falling down and people covering their heads. I don't know if a lot of you recall that particular news clip, but I want you to look at this sensor, which was right in Sendai. This is the seismic data that it was reporting. And again, it looks nothing like, whoops, it looks nothing like the seismographs that were being put out by the USGS on that date. On this map, you can see Sendai is located right here, and Fukushima is down here. Wait, hold on a second. Yeah, down here a ways. And this is the Fukushima, Fukushima is right here, the Fukushima airport, I'm sorry, is down here. This is where the uh, Diachi nuclear plants are located. But I just, I wanted to show you the, the sensors at Sendai, just how close they were to both Fukushima and the nuclear reactors. And again, the, the information that the sensors are picking up at the, at the Sendai location look nothing like the information that was being reported by the USGS sensors in Japan. So there's, there's just something's not jiving here. I want to show you this comparison of a seismograph. On the top in red right here, it shows what happens to a seismograph during a nuclear test or a nuclear detonation. You have this straight line going up and down here, which slowly dissipates off, as you see in this diagram. Below, in the blue, in here, you show the seismic effects of, of a natural earthquake which you've got nothing here, and then slow rumblings, 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 building up to bigger shaking right here, and then it, it, it tapers off. Now I want you to look again, and I'm, I'm sorry if this is getting very long, but there's a lot of information here. I want you to look again at the seismograph from the local sensor station in Sendai. The, I, the sensor's identification is MYG013. I want you to look at these signatures during the Japan quake as, com let me see if I can get them side by side here, as compared to a blast signature and a natural earthquake. Do you not see the indications here. And again, I'm not an expert at reading these things, and believe me, I spent over 50 hours researching information before I put this video together, and I, I've got tons of links for the research. But I want you to look at this in particular, and right here in particular. Right here, right here, right here here and here and here okay do you not see a similarity now back in um, oh geez I think it was well this was published in February of 2010 but I know it hit some of the media back in December of 2010 also there were several articles this one in particular though is from the Israel News Japan has offered to enrich uranium for Iran to allow it access to nuclear power while allaying international fears it might be seeking an atomic weapon, the Nikkei uh, Business Daily reported on Wednesday. The Nikkei Daily, without citing additional sources, reported that the proposal for Japan to enrich uranium for Iran was floated back in December with U.S. approval when Iran's top nuclear negotiator, Saeed Jalili, visited Tokyo. The point I want to make here is that I am sure that Israel was not at all happy with Japan's decision to assist Iran in supplying them with enriched nuclear 
products. Now here's where things start to get a little shady. In this article it states in February of 2010 Japan offered to enrich uranium for the Islamic Republic. Soon thereafter an Israeli firm by the name of Magna BSP headed by Haim Saboni secured a contract to run security at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Last year Israeli daily Harez reported that Magna BSP was providing security for the nuclear plant prior to the disaster. In 2010, the firm installed secu a security system which included cameras and a warning system enabling the facility's security staff to monitor anyone attempting to trespass on their site or damage a perimeter fence. The security system was designed to guard the plant against any hostile elements seeking to seize radioactive material to use in a terrorist attack. All right, so here we're now we have, we've already established that Israel is probably a little ticked off at Japan to say the least for agreeing to provide Iran with enriched nuclear materials. And now we have an Israeli-based uh, firm at a Desdemona that is providing the entire security systems for this Diachi plant. Now here's a photo of Mag Magna BSP's owl. This is the like one ton camera. This is, this is a picture of one of the one ton cameras that they supposedly put at these uh, Diachi power plants for security monitoring. Why do they have to be so big? And why do they have to weigh so much? This picture over here to the left is a diagram of a uranium gun type nuclear bomb. All right, and why this is significant, I'm gonna show you in just a second here. Over here, these are our two photos. The one on the left is the blast that we all saw on the news of the Fukushima reactor number three going up. Okay, where one of these um, BSP cameras were installed. And as you can see in the picture in the right, this blast exhibits a striking similarity to the blast on the right, which is that of a nuclear weapons test. And you can go back in this video and see the similarities between the seismic signatures of a nuclear test seismograph compared to an earthquake seismograph. And here you seem to have these two pictures supporting the same thing. Nuclear reactors, and my father, my late father worked on lots of them, don't tend to blow up, they melt down. And here's what I mean. Here's a photo of the 1986 Chernobyl reactor meltdown. And I want you to really look at this area in here. The rest of this reactor building is not really damaged. I can't tell if this is debris right here, right here, or what exactly that is. But what I really want you to look at here is the damage from the heat in a meltdown. Yes, fires do occur in nuclear reactor accidents, but the primary damage is not due to blast, it's due to heat. And pictures of the damaged nuclear reactors, like this one right here, and then this one here, show a lot of evidence of explosion damage, but I see very little evidence of heat damage, which is what you get when you have a nuclear meltdown. We've been told by the media that the major cause for the disaster at the Diachi Fukushima nuclear plants was the flooding from the tsunami. And while there's no doubt there was damage from the flooding, as is evidenced in this picture here, the SCADA system, supervisory control and data acquisition systems, 
are specifically set up with multiple redundancies to prevent failure of one correction process to cascade into a failure of another correction process. I know because I worked on these systems in with mostly in oil and gas, but nuclear, it's predominantly the same. These systems are redundancy proof. Okay, you, they're designed so you don't have a catastrophic failure of the system. As we were told by the mainstream media that when the flooding came in, the generators went offline, they couldn't get them back online because the control systems were not operating properly. Well, why wouldn't they be operating proper properly? You know, and here comes the Stuxnet angle. The Stuxnet worm, which is admittedly was developed between U.S. and Israeli factions, okay, was designed to enter a, a power plant system such as a nuclear plant system and mimic the illusion to the system that the system is operating properly, thereby foregoing the redundancy um, fail-safe routines that would normally take place if the system recognized a problem. That's what Stutznet does, is it pr creates a false reality to the controller systems in these facilities so that the redundancy routines do not kick in. Now again, I want to bring your attention to these photographs here, and I want you to look at the carnage, and it, the destruction looks like it's blast-related, yes, but as I explained before, you can't get a hydrogen explosion of the magnitude required to pulverize concrete, as we see in these pictures here, twist steel, and um, you know, and here's these holes here. I don't know what the heck these are from, but I, I want you to look here. This is reactor number four. And see if I can zoom in on this. All right. If you can see this shaft right here, that's where the reactor would have been. However, about a month before this disaster, the reactor and the fuel rods were removed from this building so as they could put in new stainless steel shielding inside the building and, and upgrade the facility. So there, there's like a big open shaft here. So what caused the explosion? It, I, I'm still unclear, um, and I, like I said, I, I've done a lot of research on this, whether the spent fuel rods, which is the major concern, were in this facility when this thing was blown up. And this is um, a close-up picture of reactor number four here, which clearly looks like it was blown up. I mean, this doesn't look like a meltdown. If you go back in this video and look at the Chernobyl reactor and even go back further and look at pictures of the Three Mile Island reactor, which did su sustain a hydrogen explosion, the damage was nowhere near as devastating as as this damage and if this was a bomb or a series of bombs that went off in these reactors this was an act of war remember I told you that they couldn't build up uh, enough hydrogen even in a sealed building never mind reactor number four was where the dome was removed a month before this accident occurred to do renovation work uh, so there was no dome on the building. It, there evidently was no reactor in the building or there were no fuel rods in the building either, which begs the question, just what exploded there because everybody is saying it was a hydrogen explosion. These vents here at these nuclear facilities are passive evacuation devices, okay? When hydrogen or gas pressure builds up within the, in the reactor, these serve to evacuate the excess hydrogen and the excess gas pressure in the structure out the top of this vent so you don't get the pressurized 
hydrogen explosion reaction that we're all being led to believe had happened. And here's something else very suspicious. The security team that um, originated from Israel, the uh, Magma BSP, just up and left the Diachi reactor sent facilities in Fukushima one week before this accident happened. And all they were, they were not yet given permission by TEPCO or uh, Diachi to remotely take control of the systems at the reactor, they evidently had done so anywhere. Um, here, um, who says, although there is no access to the area, Saboni said that the cameras from his company's security system, which were installed high up, were probably not damaged and likely captured the post-quake explosions at the site. Well, where are the cameras then? Where are, why has nobody recovered these cameras? So we have Saboni stating in one paragraph that they had not yet received permission from TEPCO or anyone else at the Diachi facilities to hook in remotely to the main systems there. He's quoted as saying here that although Magma is able to gain remote access to its computer systems, which retrieves the cameras, images, blah, blah, blah. So what I'm seeing here is they didn't have permission, but they did it anyway. And here's something else that seems to be completely overlooked by the mainstream media. 24 hours after the earthquake, Fukushima police station told Government Crisis Management Center in the Prime Minister's office that an explosion occurred in Fukushima number one nuclear plant. The Nuclear Safety Agency in the Prime Minister's office refused to accept this information on nuclear reactor explosions by saying that is not possible. Well, let's look at why he says that. Go right down below here. Special advisor to the Prime Minister on nuclear power, Goshi Hosono, said no expert had predicted the hydrogen explosion would occur at the reactor building. The Japanese Nuclear Safety Commission, Haruki Matarimi, said that, th that the containment has been refilled with nitrogen, so a hydrogen explosion would not have and could not have happened. Hydrogen explosions, because um, they were, it says imprisoned, I don't know if that was the right word, by what is called um, common sense among nuclear experts, which turned out to be wrong and more like excessive self-confidence over the confidence or ego, which is part of the human working culture. So what we have here is the reason why the uh, nuclear experts for the facility could not believe the police report that a hydrogen explosion had occurred was because the containment facilities had been previously pumped with nitrogen, which would diffuse a hydrogen explosion should that um, have, have been a possibility, which evidently they knew it was. And here we see again, since hydrogen generation was not the cause of most past reactor explosions. Adequate attention was not paid to this phenomenon during the Fukushima disaster. But when cooling malfunction occurred in the Three Mile Island reactor in 1979, a hydrogen explosion occurred inside the containment vessel 10 hours after the malfunction began. The reactor building and containment vessel withstood intact in spite of the blast. So in conclusion, maybe some of the elements that occurred during the Japan earthquake and the Fukushima disaster were natural, but there is substantive evidence that there may have been man-made elements to this disaster. There is conclusive evidence that the earthquake data provided by the USGS does not support evidence provided by local seismic sensors in Japan and in and around the Fukushima Prefecture near Sendai and the Diachi 
reactors. You know, I hate to go here, but when the 9-11 disaster took place here in America, I believed what I saw on the news for days, weeks, even months preceding the event until I began to research the evidence further. And now I honestly believe there is no way that 9-11 happened the way we were told it had happened. There is concrete evidence out there that the uh, that the disaster in Japan may not have happened the way we are being led to believe. If it did not, if this was not uh, a completely natural, unpredictable event, if it was in fact an act of sabotage for whatever reason to promote whatever agenda, the perpetrators of this event are guilty of murder on a global scale. If this does in fact turn out to not be 100% related to a natural disaster, these individuals must be ferreted out and brought to justice for their crimes. If in fact this was not an accident, this brings nuclear warfare to a whole new level. I'm sure many of you have heard about the neutron bomb, which is a small explosive device, has a very small blast footprint, blast radius footprint, but expels about 10 times the nuclear radiation of a typical nuclear bomb. It's designed to immediately kill people in in the blast area, but once the blast occurs, you know, the entire nuclear reaction is over. What is happening ja in Japan is a nuclear uh, is a neutron bomb on steroids. Okay, there was no blast radius except for the initial blast that we saw in the, in the photos in this presentation here. But the problem with Fukushima is that this radiation emission is constant and is cumulative and is global. I wanna thank you for watching. Please subscribe. I have too many links for this research to post. Um, in the description box below. If you're interested, contact me and I'll email you this information. Please post your comments for, dis for discussion below here. I'll be posting a video on the radiological effects of this disaster that are occurring now in the Northern Hemisphere. Please subscribe to this channel. Are you still sleeping? Are you awake yet?